In our previous video, we covered how it was Thunderfoot's arguments crashing and burning, not the Hyperloop as he claimed in the title of his video. And that gets even worse in his next video about how the Hyperloop can be destroyed in SECONDS! Here, he's using the collapse of a tanker to claim that this is exactly what can happen to the Hyperloop tube. And it got me thinking, is this how the Hyperloop is going to end? And the short answer is, no it isn't. We'll get to why in a minute. Thunderfoot follows this up by re-showing his graphical representation we talked about in the fifth video in this series. It's worth pointing out that our response there doesn't apply in this particular instance. There, we were talking about the difficulty of maintaining a vacuum, or of aerodynamics, or drag effects, or issues regarding the pod's forward compressor. For all of those issues, pressure differentials should be represented logarithmically, and that was what our response was aimed at. However, now, Thunderfoot is talking about something different. The amount of external force bearing down on the tube. For that purpose, you do look at a linear differential, not logarithmic. So in this case, there's no real issue with considering the interior of the tube to be a full vacuum, and we're happy to do so. But the main takeaway was always understanding when this relationship should be linear and when it should be logarithmic. Thunderfoot clearly doesn't understand that, and it took until now to find one case where he's actually using it correctly. But it's still an invalid comparison for several reasons. Tanker cars are designed to hold up against a positive internal pressure, not a negative one. As such, the tanker walls don't have to be as strong as the ones being used for the Hyperloop and don't need any of the internal support structures we showed you in our last video on the subject. We couldn't find the exact model of tanker car used in this demonstration, but we did find one that's similar in design and almost identical to one Thunderfoot looks at later. It has a diameter of 10 feet 8 inches, 46% larger than the Hyperloop tube. Compressive strength is inversely proportional to the diameter, as is the force bearing down on it. And so if you combine the two, then even if everything else about the design were the same, the Hyperloop tube would be over twice as strong. But it's not the same. The wall thickness of this tanker is 11 millimeters, half that of the Hyperloop tube, as specified in the Hyperloop Alpha document. The strength of the wall is proportional to the square of the thickness. So this would be a fourfold increase in strength, and if you put both of those together, you'd need a force almost eight and a half times stronger than what's required to collapse this tanker. Meaning that one atmosphere of pressure on this tanker is the equivalent of eight and a half atmospheres of pressure on the Hyperloop tube. That's the underwater pressure at a depth of over 280 feet. And again, that's without considering the internal supports. After several minutes of repeating himself, Thunderfoot finally gets to a new point. But it did once again get me thinking about how much energy it would actually take to pump down the Hyperloop to a vacuum. And it turns out it's just pressure, which is one atmosphere a 100,000 pascals, times the change in volume. You've got to displace about two tons of air. And the minimum energy requirement to create a vacuum that size is about 0.2 gigajoules of energy, which is about the same energy as 50 kilograms of TNT. That's half my body weight, eh, give or take, of high explosive. Once again, Thunderfoot is trying to engage your incredulity by looking at this energy as a really huge number, completely devoid of context. But 0.2 gigajoules is about 56 kilowatt hours, which is about $5 worth of electricity. So what actually is Thunderfoot's problem here? But he seems completely unwilling to learn, as he follows it up with a point we absolutely eviscerated in our previous videos. And that's it. If they had a vacuum failure, it would be firing a capsule down the track like a ping pong ball in a vacuum demonstration. Whoa! And basically, the energy it would release on the impact of the end would be about the same energy as 50 kilograms of TNT. There's also something else Thunderfoot doesn't understand about vacuums. Which is one of the reasons why in, when we're in labs and we're dealing with vacuums in glassware, they're frequently coated in plastic, such that if there is an implosion, it catches all the fragments of glass. Whoa! The difference is, glass is brittle, whereas steel is ductile. It can actually absorb quite a bit of energy. The glass cannot, so pretty much its only option is to break. Also, this glass is a sealed environment, unlike the Hyperloop. 
I wonder if Thunderfoot believes those scenes in movies where a single bullet hole causes people to be sucked out of an airplane. The airplane works more or less the same way the Hyperloop would, only in reverse. In an airplane, air is continually pumped in faster than it's leaving to maintain increased pressure. In the Hyperloop, air is continually pumped out faster than it's coming in to maintain decreased pressure. But in neither case is it a sealed environment. As we showed before, any breach in the Hyperloop tube would just result in the pumps having to work a bit harder, and if the breach were big enough to make that impossible, the result would be a gradual repressurization of the tube, not a physics-defying wall of air. Of course, it was probably inevitable he'd bring up the Mythbusters episode. These tank cars are actually pretty tough little bastards. That's until I put a dent in the tank truck. And then, boom. Similar to the tanker we looked at earlier, this one has a 10-foot diameter and almost half-inch thick steel. Unless you think that the shell is thin, it's actually almost half an inch thick. So pretty much 11 millimeters, very similar to the one we just examined, and found to be much weaker than the Hyperloop tube, even disregarding the Hyperloop's internal supports, which this tanker doesn't have. It's just a shell. There's no internal gusseting at all. There are a few things Thunderfoot neglected to mention. First, instead of just doing that dent, they also made a lot of changes to the tanker to get it to collapse. The team bypasses the safety features. And also, the amount of things they had to do to make it happen resulted in them calling the myth busted. We have to conclude based on the evidence that it's busted. Your average tank car, even under an impressive amount of vacuum pressure, isn't going to implode. Agreed. But that's what the Mythbusters have always done. Having busted the myth, they see what they would have to go through to replicate the results. So in addition to everything we already pointed out about tanker trucks and how much more difficult it would be to implode the Hyperloop, even the tanker truck had to have all sorts of things go wrong before it could happen. Things that couldn't cause a failure of the Hyperloop because, again, it's not a sealed system like the Mythbusters had to modify the tanker to be. The tanker collapsed because the energy released by the collapse of the vacuum was greater than the energy required to flatten the tanker. But it's more than that. There's something called activation energy, which is something the Thunderfoot should know about as a PhD chemist. Here is a typical diagram showing how this works. The tanker car is analogous to an exothermic reaction. It starts with a higher energy level, which represents the potential energy due to the pressure differential. The hump in the middle is the activation energy required to initiate the collapse. A perfectly round tank would have a very high activation energy because the vertical pressure working towards flattening the tube horizontally is offset by horizontal pressure working towards flattening the tube vertically. When the Mythbusters dented the tanker car, it lowered this activation energy, reducing the amount of pressure required to collapse it. It's no coincidence that the collapse happened in the same direction as the dent. The dent increased the vertically projected area and reduced the horizontally projected area, thus introducing an imbalance that increases as the tube flattens. The steel will absorb a certain amount of energy as it collapses. In this case, it absorbed much less energy than was released by the collapse of the vacuum. Making the tube wall thicker would not only increase the activation energy, but also increase the amount of energy absorbed by the steel. Of course, the engineers understood this, and the proposed thickness of the tube was justified on page 27 of the Hyperloop Alpha document. A tube wall thickness between 0.8 and 0.9 inches, 20 to 23 millimeters, is necessary to provide sufficient strength for the load cases considered, such as pressure differential, bending and buckling between pillars, loading due to the capsule weight and acceleration, as well as seismic considerations. If the amount of energy required to flatten the tube exceeds the amount released by the collapse of the vacuum, then a cascading failure becomes not only unlikely, but impossible. Thunderfoot has done nothing at all to show that there is any serious chance of this kind of collapse occurring. And in the end, like with our other videos on the subject, we see that that's all Thunderfoot has ultimately provided. Nothing at all.